Welcome to The Stumbling Spirit, Contemplations on the Path of Resilience. Whether you realize it or not, you are resilient. It's your birthright. As you take in your next breath, know this truth. It's not only about your capacity to overcome difficult situations, but it's about your courage to do the necessary work to heal, learn, grow, and move forward. What you gain is invaluable wisdom. And it's through these hard stumbles in life that we often discover a new purpose that aligns with our spirit. My name is Fabio Da Silva Fernandez, Reiki master, mindfulness coach, and mystical explorer. Join me weekly as the Stumbling Spirit podcast highlights the lives of extraordinary people like you, sharing transformative stories and beneficial practices of resilience to guide you on your wellness journey. The Dark Night of the Soul is a book written by 16th century mystic John of the Cross, in which he gives a roadmap of the bumpy journey towards finding union with God. For mystics the world over, the path to oneness with the Creator is often solitary, fraught with suffering, and blessed with divine ecstasy and revelatory truths. Stephen D'Amico is no different. He is a self-described guru who through a series of supernatural events and spiritual self-realizations has attained a permanent state of enlightenment. In fact, Stephen believes that enlightenment is not only achievable for each of us, but that humanity will collectively awaken in this lifetime. Here to discuss his message, memoir, and mystical insights is author, poet, spiritual teacher, and childhood friend, Stephen D'Amico. Hi, Stephen. Hey, Fabio. I just want to ask a couple of foundational questions before we delve into your personal experience. In your view, what is God? The simplest definition is the source and substance of creation. And how do we experience that? When we connect with God, ultimately we're connecting with the divine essence in ourselves first, which we then realize is not only our true self, our true nature, but that it's the true nature of everything in existence. That everything in existence is a manifestation of the formless realm prior to creation. And everything emerges out of this mystery to become this moment right now. And we'll talk a little bit about your experience in terms of connecting with the formless realm and find out a little bit more about what that is. But before we get there, can you also maybe at a high level describe what enlightenment is? Like other than what I just said, because what I just said is enlightenment. I mean, that's what enlightenment is. Enlightenment in in the most Catholic or broad meaning of the word, you know, like the most all encompassing understanding of enlightenment is the realization of our true nature. And then beyond that, or further to that, it often follows, sometimes not right away for, you know, for the first person that begins to experience getting in touch with their own true self, they might not then make the leap to the realization that this formless essence, this this divine substance that, that is really the bedrock of your entire identity and everything else is just, you know, something that gets layered onto that so you can have a human experience. You know, you sort of realize that your body, your mind, your personality, these are all things that just become part of being incarnated as a human being, but they're not your true nature. They're not your true self. It's the vehicle that you use while you're, while you're having a lifetime of experience here. You recently wrote a book called The Lost Book of Mystical Insights, which is a collection of poetry and reflections. And I want to read one of your passages. Every spiritual seeker has to go through a dark night of the soul, or two, or maybe even three, or four, or more, before becoming a totally liberated human. It's part of the purification process that prepares your body and heart and mind for all the plunging and rising into cosmic mystery of being. We can't incarnate the glory of our higher selves 
until we drop our egos and conquer our lower selves. What is it about suffering that propels people on the mystical path to this space of enlightenment? Well, in the most existential sense, you, you know, in, when people are on a path and they're struggling to sort of answer those big questions that drive the search for enlightenment, even if you don't know that's what you're seeking, it, it arises out of a dissatisfaction with your experience because you've forgotten your connection to true nature. That's the spiritual source of suffering. We suffer because we've forgotten who we truly are. That's kind of the paradox of life, right? So we come on this plane to experience something, and yet part of our purpose is to remember who we are. And then the question becomes then, what is the point? Ultimately for the joy of it, even though it's not always joyful. Even if you look at your own life, and you look back at all of, and we all suffer. I mean, suffering also serves other purposes beyond pushing or propelling the soul to try to rediscover its connection to God. Even if you look back on your own life, and we've all we've all had periods that don't go well. I mean, I'm coming out of a three-year period. Maybe we'll talk about that during the interview of, of intense suffering. You still, if you look back, you say, even though there was so much suffering, I'm still glad that I lived my life, that I got here, that I am who I am today. And how many people look back and say, it wouldn't change anything? Well, I mean, you think, why would you say that? I mean, you look back and you're like, I should have changed this, this, and this. And yet in, in those moments when we're true to ourselves, we say we wouldn't change anything because we know deep down that we're we're on a journey and that we're exactly where we're supposed to be and what ifs and, and the path that would have taken our lives in a different direction, but ultimately it's all for our own growth, our own development. Do you think that it's possible for someone to have a mystical experience or be a mystic without realizing they're a mystic? Absolutely. Often people will awaken and for whatever reason, it, it could be the loss of a spouse, sometimes a, a huge event in life, the loss of a child, your house burns down. And not always, it can't, you know, it doesn't always have to be something external like that. It can just be an internal process. But that rediscovery, that recognition of who you truly are, part of what you realize is that you've never not been that. You've always been that. You've just forgotten it. And as soon as you remember, it's it's a non-conceptual knowing. You just know it because you are it. You become it. That's how you know it. You know it by remembering it and becoming it. I mean, that's how we know anything. But in this case, it's that it's that knowing that just emerges. And you may never even try to then go back and figure out what happened. You just know that now you're awake and before you were asleep and you don't feel the need to tell anyone. Because it's an authentic awakening. People, It's very popular today for people to, you know, they have a realization and right away they want to go and tell everyone what that realization was. And there is an impulse to do that. Because when you discover some kind of truth about life, you want to share it with other people because you know that truth is important to know. But for the purpose of spiritual progress, it's sort of better to keep that stuff to yourself. Even though I wrote a whole book about my own journey. <laughs> for your own development, it's better to just keep it until it's really integrated. Once it's integrated, tell whoever needs to hear it at the appropriate time. That's an interesting point about the integration piece before sharing. I think also too, when I reflect on experiences that I've had, I am reticent to share because I don't know how that information will be held. That's right. And it's still raw. It's you're still you're still processing, you're still working through it. It's yours. It's your precious thing that you're going through. And if you have a, a you know a loving partner, you can share it with them because you trust that they'll hold the space for you and, and support you and just help you work through it until you come out the other side. But that's a precious period. And the impulse to share should sort of be resisted because for your own healing, it's better to just keep it to yourself until it's integrated. And then once it's integrated, you've got another little piece of wisdom, You're a little bit smarter, a little bit wiser about life. I want to get back to that because I think that's a really important piece when we reflect on how do we raise collective consciousness, but I want to save that for later on in the conversation. One of the things that I like saying instead of midlife crisis is midlife awareness, because I find that the connection to the, I guess, true self, yes, there are mitigating factors related to suffering, losing people that are important to you in your life that 
help us examine who we are as individuals and our purpose, overall purpose. But I find that that's more appropriate to apply this idea of midlife awareness versus midlife crisis. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I like it. I mean, you know, a midlife crisis can be a time of reckoning, right? Like, you know, the typical example is the person that's career driven and they get to a point where they realize like, the point of the career is to actually have enough material sustenance to celebrate the joy of having a family if you have a family but we, it's so hard to keep that balance i mean i didn't have children because i knew i couldn't keep the balance i want to go back in time to when you were a child and one of the things i learned in reading your books is that the veil between this physical realm and the spiritual realm was always very thin for you. There was a recurring vision that you had as a child before you went to sleep. Can you describe for us what that was like and what you experienced? So what I experienced uh, as I fell asleep every night was what is traditionally called the divine spark. And the divine spark is what I call vehicles of transformation just because i don't have any other way to describe what what these are but these are things that are available to us as human beings that can facilitate various transformations that are beneficial for our spiritual growth development and ultimately awakening and so the divine spark is something that has been experienced across cultures throughout time you find it everywhere so many traditions talk about the divine spark and it's a phenomena that arises from true nature. And really what it is, is a little spark of the creative light of God that God uses to manifest creation. Everything in creation comes from the formless source, which is just dazzling darkness. It's just infinite dazzling darkness or consciousness itself or beingness itself. But out of that arises the divine light and traditions talk about the divine light as the, the creative light that is what the divine uses to manifest itself into the physical universe and everything in between. So it comes, everything is, is first born in darkness, but it grows through the light. And we can experience a little piece of that light that comes to us in meditation. You know, if you're focused on the third eye, it can arise from off in the distance. And as you begin to notice it, it moves towards you and becomes brighter and brighter and brighter until it ultimately absorbs you in the light itself. So that's the typical sort of most generic experience. My experience growing up had a couple other elements that I haven't been able to find in any other traditions in any of the literature of the world. But in my experience, as I was falling asleep, so this would happen, I would close my eyes, I would sort of just gaze off into the distance, be, you know, in the blank screen behind my eyes, knowing that this light would emerge because it emerged every night. And as it drew closer, it would, at first it would pause and become sort of like the moon, sort of a, just an opalescent, pearly kind of sheen. And I would just be mesmerized by it. I mean, it's just sort of like a moth to a flame, just sort of beholding this wonderful, beautiful light. And then as soon as I got to that point in this process, that moonlight light would begin to grow even bigger and bigger until ultimately I was no longer looking at the light as an object in my mind but it became one with the light itself. And then I would bask in that feeling absolute bliss, pure spiritual bliss is the, the primary quality of God's light. <laughs> Just this, but there were other, other aspects that allowed me to see what that light was made of. And, and I, you know, I described some of that or all of it really in my autobiography. But just to proceed with then what would happen next is that the light would begin to shrink and shrink and shrink until it reappeared as that moon-like orb in the, in the center of my consciousness. But I would notice that it had little sunspots on it, you know, little dark blemishes. And uh, I knew that that kind of darkness would eventually extinguish the light. And there was nothing that I could do to stop that from happening. So that orb would just begin to slowly lose its light as this darkness sort of took over and completely replaced all the light until there was no light left. And at the same time that that was happening, this phenomena would begin to shrink again down to that like star-like point of light that it would be at the beginning of this metamorphosis. Except this time, instead of being a divine spark of light, it was like this infinitely compact, 
but highly detailed sort of massive roots. <laughs> and at that point, I knew that I had no other choice except to resist and just become one with that sort of what felt like a decaying dot, this thing that would just decay life, decay life, decay everything. And as soon as I did that, I would completely fall into the formless source of creation, what I, what I knew to be the formless source of creation. And that's always a wonderful experience. And I would always be glad that I got there, even though I had to go through the first part of the journey was great. The second part, not so great, but I always knew that it would always bring me back to my fundamental true nature. And then I would just enjoy that. And then if I wanted to, I could reproduce the whole and go through the whole process over and over again, five, six, seven, 14, 20 times a night. Because you've mentioned it a couple of times, I think it's a good point for us to elaborate a little bit further. So you mentioned the formless realm. And earlier you said that this is a space of divine consciousness, of nothingness. So where does it sit in the realms of realms? Where does it sit, this formless realm? You mean, is it above, below, beyond this yeah. realm? Yeah. When you talk about the formless realm, is the formless realm, does that equal heaven? No, it's, it's the source of heaven. Heaven is just a manifestation of the formless realm. But the formless realm is everywhere and everything. Right now, this moment is simply the formless realm manifesting itself as this moment. For you and me, it's this moment. But for the rest of creation, it's whatever moment they're experiencing and whatever sentience be exists beyond this planet. It's all whatever. The, the formless is ultimately manifesting everything as it is right now. But... The way that we connect with it generally is by going in and kind of just dropping down a little bit. But that little bit could be a thousand leagues. It's, I mean, it becomes sort of up and down, quickly loses its, its, its meaning. You're just sort of dropping into the underlying presence that you know is there. And if we drop into that, then ultimately what happens, and we just really allow ourselves to drop into it, there is a feeling of rising up. And we sort of experience ourselves now as the higher self. But the aesthetic quality, the emotional quality of that is still the same. It's the feeling that the true nature of reality and the source of reality is consciousness or beingness. I have a question around near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, right? Because when I read your memoir, it sounded like this connection that you were having so it was being presented to you but it was also a conscious choice for you to enter the formless realm when i think about out-of-body experiences and your death experiences it's not in my understanding of it a conscious choice but it is something that just happens when someone is near death or someone has died Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts around what you experienced in terms of your connection to the formless realm and near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences? Is there a difference or is there something that is similar between those two experiences or is it the same? A near-death experience is a glimpse of what happens when you ultimately die, when you, when you finally die we all go through a process of ultimately reflecting on the life we just lived. And how that comes about is as unique as our own dreams at night. And the subtle realm or the afterlife realm is no different in sort of the way it manifests as the dream realm. They're pretty much the same. Things that are a little more fluid, the same laws are a little looser, you know, that's why we can swim underwater, fly potentially, you know, do these things that we can't do in this realm, because in that realm, the same rules are a, a little looser. And the whole purpose of that afterlife and in between life period is to really reflect on the life you just lived and gather whatever wisdom and compassion and whatever divine qualities that you cultivated to spend time integrating those and whatever you fail to develop in areas that you should have, that also gets presented to you. 
And that's the part that can be difficult for people. That's what gives rise to the not so nice near death experiences that some people talk about, you know, being in these hellish realms and, you know, having demons digging into their body and pulling out feces and just horrible things. But all of that is the same kind of teacher that a nightmare or a dream is. You know, if, we, if we're good at analyzing our dreams, we can extract the meaning of them. It's the same with the afterlife. It's a very mercurial experience where everything is presented to you so that you can reflect and integrate on the life that you lived and prepare for the next one. And depending on how well you did, <laughs> and this is not just Judeo-Christian, although it can, this can be triggering for a lot of people, this whole idea, but the, you know, all cultures uh, talk about the afterlife experience and it's because it's real. <laughs> I want to treat them separately. I know what you mean by your question, but there's not like a clear connection between the two. But I'm glad you shared what you said because it aligns with a lot of what I've been reading or hearing from different people in that what we're experiencing is a projection and that what we experience, at least initially when we're transitioning to the other side, is essentially a projection manifestation of what we need to experience in that yeah, realm. Yeah, it's a review of the life that you just lived, which gets, you know, in, in, in some sense, it gets projected against the, the screen of consciousness, similar to when you have a dream. What's being projected are images onto the screen of your consciousness that you then look at. So just to finish the thought that this afterlife period, you sort of end up where you're karmically meant to and you hang out there. You hang out there until you are ready to reincarnate again and continue the journey. But the ultimate purpose of the journey is as physical beings to awaken to this metaphysical dimension while we're incarnated as physical human beings. That's the ultimate purpose for every human being. It's ironic because we are physical. We are physical beings, right? So if we awaken to this metaphysical realm, what does that say about our physical experience? It is what it is. I mean, this is, <laughs> we're here in the physical. It's important to understand the whole purpose of creation is for the divine to experience itself in many different ways. So the divine or God or whatever term you like to use, the source of creation, is ultimately experiencing the entire physical cosmos and everything that may be in it, not just on this planet, if there's life on other planets and the stars and all this. I mean, the divine is experiencing all of that. And then any realms in between that, all the, the Bardo realms, the subtle afterlife realms, and all the beings that are there, the divine is experiencing all of that. It's the divine light. And it's this unmanifested and unchanging yet mercurial, dazzling darkness of consciousness that creates this whole thing. We are created in the image and likeness of God. What we are is an expression of the divine that is built to understand the divine and how it manifests. We're basically made to become enlightened beings. That's what we're built for. I mean, we can do a lot of other things. We're, you know, we're a creative species. We can build, we can do, but ultimately we're built to awaken. That's what this vehicle is for. And the divine wants to awaken in the physical or any, any other dimension, but ultimately in the physical, because it's the furthest from, and it's the most radically different from the formless. So it has form. It's also furthest away from form. It's far more concrete than the subtle realm. It's far more physical. It's far more stable. There's a hardness to it. <laughs> and it's not, you, you can't deny it. And life itself is hard. I mean, it's, it's hard figuratively and also literally. This is the physical realm. And the divine gets the most joy out of waking in the physical realm because it's also the hardest realm to awaken in. It. It's the one that's furthest away from source. When we go to the afterlife, it's not as far away from the divine. And so it's easier to realize that it's all a manifestation because it's also much more fluidic. It's more dreamy. And, you know, you can manifest things easier. Like you can think of someone and all of a sudden they walk by your path or, you know, you want a peach and you walk down a street and you turn around and then there's a peach that just bloomed. I mean, that's, you know, that's the dream realm. That's the subtle realm. And it's easier to see that there's a creative process at work when you see it happening because you just thought about something and your, and your tiny little dream came true. It's clear that something is going on. That's a miracle. But we can, we can, you know, experience all of the same things here in this physical realm. And that's really what the divine wants to sort of spiritualize the physical through us to make this world more open to the divine creative light and the action that it likes to take to make life more perfect and better and more joyous and, you know, more wonderful.
what's really great about your memoir is that you give exercises about how to connect to the formless realm or how to practice elevating our vibration to be able to reach an enlightened state. And one of the exercises that you had in your book is looking in the mirror. So can you explain the mirror exercise to us? When you're doing the mirror gazing exercise that I describe in the book, you're basically using a mirror as a way to get in touch with what is generally called the witness in the spiritual literature. And really what the witness is is simply the eye of the soul. It's the soul that, that is seeing. And in our quieter moments, when we're sort of reflecting and detaching from our lives, we're sort of getting in touch with that part of ourselves. But if we understand what it is, we can get in touch with it more intentionally. And it becomes the easiest and quickest gateway to reconnect with our true nature. So we get in touch with the witness by learning to disidentify with the body, mind, thoughts, emotions, all of the stuff that's happening in our lives. We give ourselves an opportunity to just set the world aside and all our concerns aside. And when we do that, if we do it well, we naturally just start to get in touch with this part of us that's always aware. And we realize, oh, I'm always aware. Even though I get caught up in life and, you know, I get on the roller coaster of life, there's a part of me that's always there in the background just watching it all happening. And I only suffer because I forget that. So that's the first part of this exercise, is to understand that. Once you understand that, what you're doing is you're using the mirror as a way to get in touch with that. So as you're gazing in the mirror, you begin to realize that there's your reflection, and you know that that's your body. But you can also be aware of your body, and the mirror sort of provides a framework for you to allow your awareness to move beyond the confines of your body. But this is what happens naturally in deep meditation. The, you know, we sort of drop the body and our awareness begins to expand beyond it. And so the mirror gazing exercise is just an opportunity and a way of using a mirror to facilitate that process that happens more or less in, in deep meditation. I love the question, the question of who am I? Who am I really? And so really it's an invitation to step outside of our body as what you term the witness. So is the witness the higher self? Not exactly. The witness is a basic quality of the soul. Our souls are, are really consciousness and beingness and awareness, those three together. It's like a holy trinity. They're unique, but they're also connected. They're three, but they're also one. And the witness is, is just getting in touch with the awareness aspect of the soul. It's the part that's always looking. And if we get in touch with this part of us that's always looking, is always aware, and we stay with it, we realize that if we're asking, and if we ask ourselves, who am I? You know, we're really using that question in the way that was intended as a mode of self-inquiry. Then what begins to happen is we realize that the awareness is arising from this underlying field, infinite field of consciousness and beingness that gives us the sense that we're alive. We're alive because we are connected to the source of existence. And when we move deeper into that, that's when we naturally rise up into our higher self. As we rest in that, it naturally lifts us up. And we feel elated. We feel spiritually elated. It happens during sports. If, if a person is really in the zone, you know, it's because they're really in touch with the witness and they're seeing the unfolding of the play from the witness and that puts them in touch with their true nature. That's when they, they really get in the zone because now they're looking at the game from above and they're playing like puppet master with everyone that's on the field. That's a really good analogy. There's an experience that you had as a child when I read it, it freaked me out. And it's the one where you encountered the devil and you describe it as a temptation, a test, whereby you had a choice of either accepting spiritual gifts from darkness or maintaining the course of your godly path. So can you describe that experience for us? Well, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it sounds crazy just on the level of saying, you know, can you tell us about how when you encountered the devil? I mean, that's a trigger for people. And the way that I encountered the devil is even crazier. I mean, it sounds crazy to, you know, to hear myself say it out loud. I mean, it was crazy to write it down. <laughs> So I, I just prefer to speak of it in more general terms. And if people want to read about my particular encounter with the devil, they can. But the devil is really an agent of the divine. It's part of the divine economy of things. It's, it's how we get tested. And it's the biggest test. 
really. I mean, any authentic and sincere, genuine spiritual realizer is going to confront this demonic force. And it's really just the divine's way of saying, do you really love what is holy? Or are you going to give into your lower nature and use the gifts of spirit for your own whatever personal gain, the ability to manipulate others, to mind control, to start a cult? To do all this. And, and ultimately, that's what it is. And it doesn't matter if you know about this beforehand. If you go through it, it's going to be very, <laughs> very significant. It's a confrontation with the true sincerity of the very essence of what you are as a, as a spiritual being. How pure are you? How selfless are you truly? Are you fit for the divine? And if not, and you choose that path, then you're, you know, you're lost until you get out of that mess. And that, that can be quite a mess for a lot of souls who get caught up in that stuff. I, I know that you don't necessarily want to describe the specific experience, but can you maybe at least share what the internal dialogue was, how you were able to overcome that moment? Yeah, there was no dialogue. It was, you know, I was going through an occult supernatural experience, you know, as a child um, being visited by the devil who took the form of, here you go, you're getting it. Uh, the devil would manifest in the form of the Count from Sesame Street, uh, which, you know, as a child was somewhat disarming, but also kind of made me realize that whatever this entity or being was, it probably wasn't holy, but it was intriguing. And the first thing he would do is telepathically turn on the lights in my room. That's how he let me knew that he had power. He would just turn the lights on. And, and so here I am, I'm in my bed as a, as, a, as a child and I'm standing in the middle of the night with a puppet from a TV show that I loved, <laughs> but who was here in a very real way. I mean, I could reach out and touch him. It was real. I wasn't having people often ask, are you sure this wasn't just a nightmare? When you have mystical experiences, you you know what they are when you're in them. You can discount them later, but when you're in them, you know that these are not normal experiences and there's there's a there's a separate kind of reality to them. And then once uh, I realized it was happening, he would just open my mind up to all kinds of spiritual realizations, incredible realizations about how the universe operated. I mean, it's crazy occult knowledge that I never would have been able, I still can, and I can't access that knowledge even today. But this being would open me up to it. And at the same time that I would, I, I was able to sort of participate in these telepathic exchanges with the devil, all of that knowledge would disappear as soon as I thought it. So I would forget it. I, I, would, I would know what he was saying, I would understand it, and then it would disappear. And the implication is that if you wanted to retain that information, if you really want to be able to know what I know, then you had to follow me. And I always knew that this was a test. Like if I followed this being, that was to my own spiritual peril. But he also would occasionally appeal to my, some of the other uh, mystical experiences I had as a child. Was I would astral travel. So I would have these experiences of being able to, you know, leave my body and fly around my neighborhood and fly up into higher dimensions and come back down. And, and so the devil knew this. And he would say like, I, you know, you're doing that in the subtle realm. I can show you how to do that in the physical realm. I can teach you to levitate. So I was quite intrigued by that. That sounded exciting. I mean, as a child to be able to fly physically, and there's a being that's saying, I can show you how to fly. So one night I accept, I finally decided I'll, I'll just see if it's real. And so the devil took me outside of my bedroom on the staircase of my childhood home and basically released me from gravity. And I rose up in the air, probably about six feet and I was levitating. As soon as that happened and, and, the, and the devil saw that I thought it was amazing, because it was, it was, I, I was like, it was amazing. I'm, I'm floating, like I'm a magician, <laughs> whatever, I, whatever I thought as a child, I thought it was amazing. And the devil saw that I was excited and said, see, and I can show you more. Just follow me and I'll show you so much more beyond just being able to levitate, learn to levitate. And that's when I knew, again, there's the choice. If I choose to say yes, I'm going even further down this path that instinctively, intuitively, I know is the wrong path, but my curiosity is getting the better of me. And I'm sort of disregarding that inner voice that's telling me not to do it. But at that moment, I realized, no, stop it right now. Turn away, reject this thing. It's not worth it. Whatever the devil wants to do for you and whatever you, whatever power you, you gain, it, ultimately, it's going to lead to your own destruction. It's not going to turn out well. So I said no. 
it dropped me immediately and disappeared. And that was the end of that. Thank you for sharing that. What do you think is the devil? Who is the devil? The devil is just a, it's not a fallen angel. It's a function of the divine. I mean, it's been understood as a fallen angel, but really it's just, you know, it's God in disguise showing up and testing us. And if we, if we give into it, then it leads to our own destruction. And that's for, ultimately, it, it, you know, it sounds so unnecessary and destructive, but it's ultimately for our own spiritual growth, or our, own, our own spiritual development. Because in order to become fit vehicles for the divine, we have to live from our higher natures. You can't live from your lower nature and continue to develop spiritually. Your lower nature is the part of you that's selfish. Your divine nature is the part of you that's selfless. What the divine wants through us is to be the best expression of all of its qualities in physical form. And it will, it will throw the devil at us to help us get there. It's a really interesting idea and topic. You know, you talk in the book about duality and how this connection to the formless realm is really getting in touch with this non-dual nature. But in existence, there's duality, there's light, there's dark. And so when we think about God, or at least when I think about God, I think about God in the sense of the ultimate, you know, the highest vibration, frequency, and dimension of love and light. Like that's how I understand God to be. And then when I think about the devil, I think of the absolute opposite. And when I see what's going on in the world and the darkness that's going on in the world, it's hard for me to conceptualize that the devil is something that is in essence manifested by God. So yeah. can you maybe elaborate a little bit about your ideas around that? Yeah, I mean, we, we just sort of discussed what the devil represents for the individual soul on its journey. Well, the, those same forces operate collectively through us as a civilization, as a society, as a group, whatever. But when you think about it in terms of the world, it's a force that rises up through us when we're losing our way. And if it has to get super ugly, well, that's going to make us realize like, okay, all this murdering has to stop. I mean, we're better than this. But until we do that, it will continue to flourish. To me, Trump represents the Antichrist. He's a representation of just how unbalanced American society has become, how dysfunctional it's become, and by extension, other places around the world too. I mean, the rise of populism and, uh, and hatred as a political populist force is rising, or it's wanting to rise, it's trying to rise. And if we let it, there's going to be more suffering until we push it back down and keep it in check and, and appeal to our higher natures by our better angels. Let's talk about the soul's journey. So in Buddhism, there are different levels of learning from a soul perspective. And it's cyclical. Let's say a soul in this lifetime embodies that darkness. Is that something that every soul experiences? Or is it just that certain souls have this darkness within them, and they do these terrible things, and then they go on the other side and then they have their life review and then they come back and then they are slowly improving as a soul. I just want to get your thoughts on the soul's journey and whether it's inevitable for every soul to have that experience of pure darkness before they can experience pure light. No, not, not to the extent of, say, a Hitler. <laughs> we don't have to become Hitlers on, on, you know, on this grand, grander uh, journey of many lives. None of us usually have to go that far. You know? Hitler was probably a manifestation the same way Trump was and, and still is of what was happening on the planet at that time. He, he represented the thing that rose up, but there was enough support for it to allow all of that darkness to emerge into our collective field and, and cause World War II. Most souls, you know, may dabble in things that are morally questionable and get corrupted to a certain extent before they realize I have to clean up my life. This is not this is not the right way to live. But most people don't have to become murdering rapists in order to get there. One of the things you mentioned in your book is that you feel that you've been here before 
and that when you were in the physical plane in your previous life, that you were a guru. Can you explain a little bit about what you perceive your soul's journey to be in terms of your previous lives and what you're experiencing in this incarnation? Well, just to be clear, so I remember incarnating in, in this life. That happened during my awakening uh, when I was 22. I recall choosing this incarnation and the purpose for this incarnation. Uh, but I've never experienced my past lives the way that some people can. I may one day, that'd be nice, be interesting to see and to know, but that hasn't happened yet. But I, I have had intimations of being a guru. Like I, you know, there are things that you just know, like I know this is not my first time doing this. I've done this before. And there are things that have happened in this life that made me realize that in other ways. You know, I, I, this is old territory. I've done this before, but nothing specific. One of the things you write about is being inspired by certain mentors in your life. And one of the mentors that you had growing up was a gentleman called Mr. Michael. Can you explain a little bit about who Mr. Michael was and how he inspired you or influenced you on your spiritual journey? Sure. Uh, Mr. Michael was a gentleman who moved into our neighborhood when uh, I was around, I don't know, maybe eight you know, as a young child. And um, he opened up his house to any of the kids in the neighborhood that wanted to come and listen to the gospel. He presented it as the Good News Club. And basically, it was a place for kids to kids in the neighborhood to come and, and hear about the Bible. So we would all come to his house and he would teach us different stories from the Bible. It was a very fun place. He was a loving man, so sweet. And he would sing, he would teach us songs and it was just a place to gather with other kids and have a good time in a way that was a little bit like maybe this is what church is supposed to be and I'm having a, a whole lot of fun, but it, you know I'm, I'm not really going to tell anyone about it because it was a little bit. You know, we, we, if we saw each other, we knew that we went to the Good News Club, but we weren't telling everyone in, the, in you know in the neighborhood that we were going to this place and listening to this guy. So if you found out about you got in, you probably stayed because it was a wonderful time for everyone that was there. For me, it was. Uh, it was an opportunity to just practice the joy of celebration with other people spiritually in a way that I could do that. I wasn't, you know, self-conscious or thought, oh, this is so, so silly. I'm not going to do that. He made it approachable and we, we sang songs and, and there was one song in particular that I loved and it would, I, it was sort of sung in a, in a way that's similar to how a mantra might be chanted. And every time we sang that song, I just blissed out like for hours afterwards. So just a special time. I was lucky to have, have that in my life. My brother was a part of it and two of our childhood friends were a part of it. And we all still talk about how, what a special opportunity that was. Every night as a child, when you were seeing that pinpoint of light and you were entering into the formless realm, this was something that you did on a regular basis. But then just before high school, you decide to disconnect from doing these exercises, from accessing the formless realm. Why did you make that decision to disconnect? Because ultimately I knew that it was my destiny to be a spiritual teacher guide. I didn't think of that in those terms at the time. I just knew that in, in combination with the divine spark and the mirroring exercise that I practiced as a child and some other things that I did, I knew how to reconnect with my true nature and I would do it all the time. And I knew that most human beings and my peers sort of, you know, forgot if they ever knew they, they slowly forgot. We sort of all slowly disconnect from our true nature. We're sort of born in touch with it. But then as we become acclimated to, you know, being a human being, a little, a child, and you know growing and developing in a family we slowly lose touch with it our parents also kind of push it out of us because they're disconnected from it and they don't know how to nurture it so and the world tells us to ignore it you know it's not it's not the source of happiness the source of happiness is doing of achieving and you know all of these things that are going to make you happy and we slowly get disconnected from it but i i never did i i had ways to reconnect with it so even though that normal process of being taught and educated by our parents and society to basically disconnect from our true nature even though that was trying to happen i never forgot because i had these ways of staying connected and i knew that one day when i became an adult and i had some kind of authority 
that I could tell other people how to do it because I knew that they had forgotten. And I knew that this was something that I had to do. That basically it was the purpose of my life. I knew that, that that's what I was meant to do. And in order to do that and to be a good guide, to be someone that that could um, show others the way, I had to go through the same experience of forgetting, just to have the experience of forgetting, to know that I didn't know. And also, I think to prove to myself so that I could say with confidence to other people, listen, if you do these things, they're going to work because I did them, then I stopped doing them. And then I started doing them again and they worked. So the, the decision when I was uh, a teenager was to go through a process of forgetting just like every other soul does. So I could experience being unawake, being asleep and in the process of awakening. Also, I think discover new things as well as rediscovering the things that I've forgotten. Ultimately, what I discovered is these bodies are, are made to awaken. We're built for it. We just don't know how to use it. We don't get a, a user's manual. I mean, there, the, the information is out there if we, you know, we want to find it, but it's, you know, it's quite difficult to figure it all out without the guidance of somebody who knows. I want to talk about that period of time, though, because even as a child, when you were having these experiences, you led a fairly lonely existence. It was a lonely time because you were having these experiences and trying to understand what these experiences were ultimately about. And then when you disconnected from it in high school, there was a sense of loss around not connecting with the formless realm as well. If you could describe a little bit about just the mental state that you were experiencing as well as the emotional state. Basically, what I experienced was what we were talking about earlier is the, the suffering that comes from forgetting. Because when we forget our true nature, we forget the underlying subtle joy that makes life truly manageable. I wouldn't even say enjoyable, just to, you know, to sort of get through life. If you lose that joy, <laughs> life is, can be pretty difficult to get through which is why you know most people suffer is because they've lost that joy they've lost their inner joy and they've lost their inner joy because they're they're no longer connected to their true nature for whatever reason it's that searching and yearning for union with source that's what the spiritual search is about but if we're really disconnected from true nature then we tend to go through the dark night of the soul this experience of existential malaise, like just like everything is so flat. Why am I even doing this? Why do I get up every day and go to this job and then come home to my screaming kid? Like, what is the point of it? You just become so disenchanted with life because you're not being nourished by your spiritual essence. And you think you're the only one that is feeling that way. And, you know, then you feel guilty that you feel that way. This is a prevalent modern health issue. People are suffering from existential malaise because they're not connected with their true nature. That's why there's so much depression. And when you're in that state, you feel so lonely because not only do you not feel like you can't connect with anyone and find or extract any joy or meaning out of life, you feel like a failed human being for not being able to do it. And it's very lonely. But that loneliness can often lead to an existential crisis, which is an opportunity to have a spiritual awakening. So instead of a midlife crisis, midlife awareness, or whenever it happens. You reconnected in university, and it was done through the medium of writing. And you talk about this experience that you had while in class, and you see a vision of an ex. First of all, maybe describe how writing inspires this connection to the formless realm. And then also explain that vision of the X and how you at least in initially, initially interpreted it. Uh, at that point, I didn't really even understand what I was searching for anymore. I just knew that there was this thing about myself that I had forgotten. So I was trying to find a way to get back in touch with that. And I thought that maybe writing could be a way for me to rediscover that. But it doesn't have to be writing. What really matters is that you're searching. You want to know. You really want to find out the answer to the, the meaning of life. That's the thing that fuels the, the actual process. And then how that unfolds is unique to every individual. For me, writing became important, but it wasn't the only thing that I was doing, but it was definitely a significant one. And how and why, that's a big conversation. 
what I can say is that the thing that you're talking about was I was in my second year of university and I decided to take creative writing as one of my electives so that I could use writing as a way of possibly uncovering the meaning of existence or even using poetry as a way to elevate and transform my consciousness. So that was my intent. And in a class that I was in, the instructor for the class was a Canadian poet, Christopher Dugney. People may or may not know about him, but when we started the first day of class, he introduced himself as somebody that was part of a serious commitment to transform human consciousness in the 60s. So I thought, okay, well, this guy's interesting. <laughs> I'm in the right place. And in one of his classes, what we would do is we would uh, submit work anonymously, and then it would be redistributed to the class, and we would read it and then just kind of comment on it. Sometimes he would comment on it, and sometimes he wouldn't. And one day, there was a poem that went around, and I thought, as soon as I looked at the poem, I thought, no other student submitted this. It was written on dot matrix printer, which was outdated technology at that point, and it looked like it had been photocopied many times over, so it was also blurry, which just looked like a really old, like something that's been around a long time. Whether or not he submitted it, I, I don't know. He doesn't know. I asked him about it years later, and he said possibly, but he doesn't remember. But as soon as I read that poem, and I don't remember the poem in its entirety anymore, but I do remember the one line that had the, the most impact. It was an image that was created, and it finished off with a million plates of the moon. And that image, that poetic image, of this idea of like just a million plates of the moon stacked one on top of the other became a sort of a, a metaphorical vehicle for me to, again, just have an out-of-body experience. Maybe there was something in the poetry that contained the power to, to do that. I don't know. Poetry does contain that power. It can. So I think it probably did. So I'm in class and all of a sudden I'm out of my body looking down on the classroom, <laughs> knowing that we're talking about this poem that just had this profound effect on me. And Dudney was asking different people in the class what they thought of it. it was sort of popcorn style. He often didn't say, what do people think of it? He would just give you the opportunity to say something. And then if there was a, a long enough silence, he'd say, okay, next one. But on this day, he actually asked a few people what they thought of it, which made me think it was his. And I think on the third time he asked me, and I didn't really want to say anything about it, but I thought it was amazing because, you know, I'm now out of my body, but I didn't want to share that with anyone. And while I was in that transcendental state, I had a vision of an ex that just appeared in my mind's eye. And as soon as it appeared, I knew that it was something significant, that it was something that was going to be potentially beneficial for my journey, but I didn't really know for sure. But it was definitely mystical and I knew it. And then it sort of gradually receded into the distance of my consciousness and I kind of came back down into my body. That vehicle of transformation, which is, you know, sort of how I refer to these phenomena in a general way, became quite significant in terms of helping me become fully self-realized or to fully remember my true nature in a way that I, I've never forgotten it since. So let's fast forward a little bit. It's 1996. And this is when you have your major awakening. It was so powerful that it cracked the foundation of your house. And all of the power of that was you met God. Can you describe what that experience was like that night? It started on, on the car ride home after hanging out with a friend. At this point, my spiritual journey, you know, it's pretty intense at this period. There's a, there's a lot that's happened up to this point that's really like fueling my journey. And on the night it happened, I came into my house and I lay down on the couch and I was sort of mulling over some of the things that I was contemplating at the time that were part of my search for understanding, you know, what's the purpose of life? Who am I really? Does God really exist? All of those questions are sort of all percolating and that all kind of just sort of crystallized into an intense focus. And I, I had already begun to rediscover how to do this, but I used the opportunity to really get in touch with the witness. So now I'm on my bed and I drop into the witness and I'm really just experiencing the witness itself. And the question that, that I had asked myself is if I can be aware of myself as a witness, then what's the source of witnessing? And that inquiry instigated a spiritual transformation that I went through that night that is pretty rich and varied in terms of all the things that, that happened. That's when I, you know, remembered incarnating and why I had incarnated, that it was my purpose to be a teacher, 
one day ultimately. I wasn't ready at that point, but the knowledge was there. But the core experience was really dropping from the witness into true nature. And how that happened specifically was this ex that had shown up in my poetry class. Since that time, it had begun to arise spontaneously in my awareness for several months. And it would, in the same way that the divine spark would lead me through a transformation, the, the ex would do the same thing, but in a different way. Uh, it would pull me into, the X would arise in the field of my awareness, and it would pull my attention into and through it, through the center of it. And when it did, my whole consciousness would be lit up with divine light. And then when, when the light sort of dissolved, I would realize the oneness of everything. So I would have an experience of understanding and knowing that everything is unified by this mystery that is the source of existence. But at that point, I hadn't fully experienced that source itself. But the X was definitely propelling my search because it was giving me these glimpses of this non-dual understanding of reality. And at the sort of the climax of this fairly rich spiritual experience, the X appeared and then it transformed itself into what looked like a vortex. And that's when I heard the voice of God and this presence that had actually manifested in the basement of my childhood home, which is where I was living at the time while I was in university, I moved into the basement. And so the entire, my entire room was filled with this presence that I knew was vast and eternal, but I didn't know what it was yet. And it said, if you want to know the answer to, it didn't say it direct, in words, it was just direct knowing transmitted directly. If you want to discover the answer to your question about the witness and any other spiritual question you have, you have to go into the void. And I, I was quite apprehensive because I didn't know what that would do and where it would be. But eventually I just decided to go for it. And as soon as I did, my body mind went through sort of like a shamanic shattering. My identity completely exploded and dissolved. And I found myself in a realm that was featureless and formless and just kind of eternally empty and nothing else. It was just sort of empty. And I thought, oh, oh like I've made a mistake. This is not good. There's nothing here that feels alive. There's no you know, dazzling darkness of consciousness. But as soon as that happened, the presence I realized was coordinating this entire experience. And that's when it lifted my consciousness up into my higher self. And I connected with God who presented himself as I am. And more transformations happened after that. And as I was leaving that space, actually, there's a part before I left where the divine said, and I knew I was rediscovering the source of existence. The divine said, you know, you can stay here if you want, or you can go back to your life. It's your choice. And I realized I could stay there and I guess not come back into my body. And I guess my body would have died. Or I could come back. And I knew if I came back that I wouldn't lose my connection to this understanding, this higher dimension of pure consciousness that I was in. I knew that I wouldn't forget it. Like it's now it's established. You're not going to forget it. But you want to go back to your life and live with that. And I said, yes. And at that point, I went through a, a series of other transformations that, that brought me back into my body. But as I was, just before I left, I, I decided, okay, I'll come back into my life. The divine said, oh, one more thing before you go, uh, you're going to have to tell other people about this. And it was sort of in a, a reassuring way, but also like, gotcha. Like, you know, I know this isn't going to be easy, but you got to do it. And uh, I really didn't think too much about it at the time. Because the whole experience was so transformative, it took a few years to even begin to understand what I went through. And during that period, like we were talking about before, I, I wasn't really trying to understand it. I was just holding it, trying to integrate it, making sure it was firmly established, not talking about it to anybody, telling everyone I met God. <laughs> you know, there's a real sense of purpose in relation to these experiences that you've had. And... I want to explore that in a little bit, but I feel like I need to touch upon something else first. After this awakening, you change your life. You become a vegan, you start running, and then after university, you decide to work as effectively an arborist in Northern Ontario and Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So, this is where you planted trees and you helped stop the spread of wildfires. So you're in this random place, random town in Saskatchewan, and you meet a stranger on a motorcycle called Tim. And what you discover is that he had the same mystical experience as you. Can you talk about that encounter 
so I was up north tree planting as part of, uh, at that point, my whole life just became focused on doing whatever was necessary to stabilize this realization and tree planting for a number of reasons I thought would be a great opportunity to do that. So that's why I was up there doing that. And on one of our, our days off, I was in town and I went to uh, one of the pickup locations that our crew bosses would come to get us at the end of the day, a laundromat. And I was outside talking with some of my coworkers and, you know, we're just talking about like, what are you going to do with your money? You can make pretty good money if you work hard during tree planting. And at the end of it, you have a nice big lump sum. So what are you going to do with your pot of gold? And I said, well, I thought I was, I was thinking about maybe buying a motorcycle and driving back to Toronto, my hometown, after the tree planting gigs had finished. And potentially at that point, we would be in British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. So that was my idea. I wasn't sure if I was going to do it or not, but that's the only idea I had. And as I was telling that story, this guy pulls up on a motorcycle and he has a for sale sign on his motorcycle, which is kind of strange to have. a, <laughs> And, you know, just one of those, you know, Canadian tire, pink and black for sale signs sort of stuck onto his bike. It was like, it was so obvious, like this guy's selling his bike just as I had been talking about it. And I had already sort of had those serendipitous moments before as part of this post-awakening phase. I started to realize like the universe talks to us if we're paying attention and gives us little clues and signs of things to follow up on or engage in. And so as soon as I saw it, I knew like I got to talk to this guy. So I, I introduced myself and told him what I was doing and that I wanted to buy a motorcycle. And that I thought it was quite interesting that, you know, I had just been talking to my friends about it and then you showed up. And as soon as I said that, he knew that I had had a meaningful coincidence. At this point, I wasn't, I didn't really know if I knew that's what it was called, but I knew what it was because I was experiencing it. And as soon as he knew, then I knew that <laughs> this was someone that knew something about what I was going through and potentially could shed some light on helping me to understand the experience that I went through. So we got to know each other for the next few hours at the laundromat, talking to each other while he was doing his laundry. And then we agreed to meet up a week later because I knew we'd be back in that town a week later just to connect and talk some more. So that initial conversation and the following week, we spent most of the day together and just the conversations that we had were helpful because he was talking about things that I hadn't really put words and ideas to, but were confirming for me. And then sort of at the conclusion of our time together, we were back at his place and he said, before you go, because my time was, was running out, uh, I just want to draw something for you that I think you'll find particularly meaningful and I know it's going to speak to you. And I said, yeah, sure. So he took a little piece of paper and he asked me to close my eyes while he, so I couldn't see what it was. And he drew it on the paper and then he folded and quartered it. And then he said, okay, you can open your eyes. And then he slid this folded piece of white paper across the table to me. And as he did, I already knew what he had written. I knew it was the X. And as soon as I opened it up, I saw it. And I told him, this is the, I saw this same symbol in my mind's eye. And it was instrumental in the awakening that I went through. And he just sort of looked at me and wordlessly let me know that what I had experienced was real and significant. And even though the world doesn't support it, what happened, happened. That whole encounter with him was really just to give me the confidence and the courage to, first of all, begin to confirm what I went through and then begin to understand it in some kind of conceptual way so that I could tell others about it. Because up until that point, I hadn't said anything to anyone. And then he said, just as we were leaving, because I knew what that symbol was, he said, it, it means you're one of the chosen ones. I, I, right away, I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, that sounds a little too messianic and self-deluded, you know, because I'm still skeptical at this point too. Like I'm taking what this guy is saying, but I don't know him from, and he's a stranger to me. And I'm in his apartment <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And he could tell I was uncomfortable. And he said, no, 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 you don't have to get worried about it. It just means that your purpose is to guide others. And so that was, again, another confirmation because I didn't tell him that, you know, the divine told me that I would have to help others. And that was the last time we saw each other. It was the last time you saw each other, but it was such a powerful experience that it stayed with you for the rest of your life, so much so that you decided to write about it. Absolutely. He represents what can happen on the path. You know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Like the, the universe provided him for me at the right time to just to give me the confirmation I needed. That supernatural aid, you don't forget that. Like that's a gift from the universe. I'm going to ask a question that is a little bit offbeat. As you were talking, I was thinking about the X-Men. I wonder, I mean, is it possible that someone had a mystical experience and wrote the X-Men based on that 
What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's an archetypal symbol. And once you start to look for it, you realize it's everywhere. If you look at some of the oldest artifacts, there's a stone that you know has been carbon dated to be the absolute oldest artifact. And all it is is a piece of clay with uh, X hatchings on the top of it. So this symbol was so important to early human beings that it's one of the earliest things that we've recorded. What does this X mean? Why is it so important? What is so significant about it? You could write books about this topic. You know, I just wrote a, a half a chapter about it, but <laughs> there's a lot to be said about it. But yeah, sure. I, I, I don't think that I'm the only one that has experienced it. In fact, I know I, I, I'm not. It's the basis of Buddhist mandalas. If you look closely at a Buddhist mandala, even though they're highly detailed, you'll notice that a common motif is that the entire image is often set up on an implied X in the painting. And it figures in Hindu yantras as well, but it's everywhere. If you start looking at sacred symbolism from ancient cultures, you see it everywhere. Yeah, it's quite a universal symbol for sure. And at least in your experience and in Tim's experience, it was a supernatural experience. Yeah, I don't know if he had that experience. I know that he had an awakening because he told me he had an awakening, but he didn't tell me much about the nature of his awakening. So we don't actually have the, the same experience. I just trusted him. I don't even think I had used the word awakening at that point, but when he said it, I knew what he meant. You mentioned the word integration. So when you finished your work up north, you return and shortly thereafter, you take on a role as a mediator. And this is something that you started doing in high school, but you sort of reclaimed for yourself as a profession. And you end up working with vulnerable women. And you talk about how in your experience of mediation with this group that you noticed there was profound healing just by your very presence. Can you describe what that was like? I don't think I thought of it in terms of my presence, although I know that my presence does and can have an impact. At the time, I just attributed it to the intention and the processes that, that we were using. And during that period, I was basically working as a social worker for an organization that was an umbrella organization for mediators and people that were involved in mediation and conflict resolution. That entire period, I was just exposed to so many healing modalities through the program. We were trained by our boss, and then we had to implement and use those skills. And all of those skills were beneficial in terms of bringing people together and allowing them to feel safe to participate in their own healing. Through the training and the experiences, you know, we had definitely experienced the sense of letting down your guard with other people and feeling that you're in a safe space in gender sharing and healing conversations and experiences. And it was also very fun. There's a lot of drama therapy incorporated into the process. So it was fun just playing with other people, but actually processing real psychological and emotional wounds and that kind of material with others. And on the night in, in particular, we were running it at a, a women's shelter. I think it was the third time we had done it, but we're sort of following the same format, which was basically to get to the drama therapy part of the process where we could, you know, feel safe sharing experiences and then working them out through play. But we were doing a preliminary activity. And during that activity, there was a distinct shift of energy that took place in the circle. You know, we're sort of sitting in a circle. And as soon as it descended and you could kind of feel that the whole energy of the room that we were in just sort of changed in a, in a way that I don't know how to describe it. I don't know if any of us could have described it, but we knew that it was healing. It was a healing presence that had descended into the group, into the room, into the circle. And as soon as that happened, there was a girl who had borderline personality disorder and definitely struggling with some pretty difficult mental health issues. In addition to being diagnosed with that, you could see she was quite hurt and broken. The first two meetings that we were getting together, she didn't really participate. She would kind of playfully, but then back off. Well, as soon as that energy descended, she went in completely and just jumped into the drama part of the process that we weren't even at yet. And then everyone in the group realized, okay, well, we're shifting gears because this girl is now doing the drama therapy component. And it was clear that she wanted to act out the lack of love that her mother had shown her growing up. 
And so she needed someone to play her mother. And as soon as she did, there was a woman who came to the group. She was quite old. She had dementia, Alzheimer's. Half the time she was not present, like mentally. But the coordinators just, she wanted to come to the group and she was harmless. She usually just sat there and watched. And sometimes she was aware of what was going on and sometimes she wasn't. As soon as this happened and this young woman got up and jumped in, this completely despondent woman became completely lucid, knew exactly what was going on, and started conveying in the moment and showing this young woman all of the love that she should have gotten from her mother in the situations that this young girl was recreating through the drama and giving her the love that she didn't get when she was younger. And it all happened so naturally and easily. There was no conversation about what we were going to do, no setup. It just happened so intuitively and automatically. And we all knew that there was a sort of higher intelligence functioning through the group and we were just willing participants in it. And then after the girl had worked through it, there were a couple other women who uh, had gotten a brutal fight earlier in the week and we sort of knew it because people talk they were on opposite sides of the room and they it was clear that they were still pretty upset with each other as soon as this healing happened for the young girl and and the older despondent woman was over they ran across the circle in the middle and just embraced each other and just started sobbing and apologizing for whatever had happened and then everyone else that was in the group all gathered around and just gave them emotional support and containment then after it was over We sort of all reflected that, okay, that was supercharged. That wasn't a normal evening. We knew that some healing energy had descended into the group. And that was my first experience knowing that that could happen. This was a glimpse into how if we create the right environment and the right conditions, that a higher intelligence and energy can operate through the group if we all just sort of go along with it. You wrote your first book, Heaven on Earth, A Guide to Enlightenment and Human Unity, when you're in Cartagena. Why was that the perfect time for you to start writing? I think it had been a few years and I was working in in Colombia as part of the same organization. This was after the job that I had doing this healing work. I had been a participant and then I was hired to be a facilitator. So I got to do the job that my supervisor had done. So I had the opportunity to run the group the following year. And then after that, they had been invited to Colombia to rewrite their curriculum, their nationwide curriculum, to incorporate conflict resolution into the curriculum. And I had been hired to be part of that. And while I was there at the start of the conference, we were asked to stand up and just talk about what brought us to the field of mediation and conflict resolution and why we were here and what were, were we here to share. So I did that. But the whole time that I was talking, what I really wanted to talk about, which was much more meaningful and the real reason, had to do with my awakening. But it wasn't the time or the place to, to share that information. So after the conference ended, I stayed in Colombia for four more days. I had a friend who I met at the conference help me to find an island where I could go to. And I just wanted to go for a little break before I came back to Canada and see if I could write about what I really wanted to write about. And so I started writing about what I would have wanted to have said at the conference if I wasn't censoring myself in terms of speaking about spirituality. That was the first writing and the first real sense of trying to explain my experience, my journey, and what I understood about the path and the nature of the human experience and and all life, really. So it started there. Yeah. So it started out with what I would have wanted to have said to the people in the audience at the conference, but then I just eventually dropped that idea and it evolved into my first book. What year was that? I think it's 2006. Since 2006, you've done many things from becoming a spiritual teacher, but also you've written two other books. At 33, you had another mystical experience where in that moment you encounter Jesus and not only Jesus, but the ascended masters such as Buddha and Muhammad. Can you describe that moment I think you described it as your second awakening. So I had finally, after, you know, waiting just over 10 years before I even would approach the idea of, you know, hanging a shingle on my door and inviting people in to let me attempt to guide them to their true nature. (laughs) I spent, you know, a good solid 10 years to make sure that I was ready. And during that time, mostly what I did in, in addition to continuing to work on writing and working in various places to support myself financially, I would just go over questions that I thought seekers would ask and I would give answers to them in my mind. 
And I did that for probably about five or six years before I thought, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I think I'm ready. And um, it was maybe a few months after I started teaching. It was on my 33rd birthday. And I had a mystical encounter with Jesus, who basically just showed me how to reconnect with the divine light, the same light that I used to connect with when I was a child going through the divine spark experience. He showed me what I needed to do internally to connect with that dimension. And basically just to become a vessel for divine light to flow through me into other people. And I began doing it while I was teaching from that point forward. And I haven't really stopped since. I mean, I've taken breaks from teaching, but now when I teach, I, I mean, I'm doing two things. Basically, I'm opening up anyone that's in the room to the presence and influence of this divine light and also guiding and teaching. Why do you think it was important for you to meet Jesus and the Ascended Masters? Uh, it's just another example of that supernatural aid that comes when you need it. It came at a time when I needed it. And the specificities of how that mystical experience unfolded, these things can happen in many different ways. That's just how it happened for me, that it was Jesus who became a spiritual being that facilitated this awakening and the ability to transmit divine light. But could have been another ascended master. So that was the core purpose, was essentially reminding you of how to access the divine light? Yes. Well, showing me. I, when I was a child, I, it's not something that I necessarily did, although in the sense, you know, it was available and I knew what to do by focusing on the divine spark. It would put me in touch with the divine light. But it showed me how to connect with that divine light without that in a different way, in a new way. I want to read another passage from your book, The Lost Book of Mystical Insights. Once you've tasted even one drop of infinity, you want the same freedom for all of humanity because you know there's no full liberation until there is a collective awakening in human consciousness. One day soon, the unseen will be seen by all and the two will become one in everyone. First of all, I, I'd like to get your opinion on what you mean by collective awakening. In the most general sense that human beings will rediscover their true nature. Think of a global remembrance, a massive awakening in human consciousness where we all collectively awaken and remember that, oh yeah, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, that we're here, there's a purpose to this. I mean, this awakening is already happening. Once you awaken or have any kind of awakening, you realize that there's an awakening happening right now. Even though it seems like the world is <laughs> falling apart, there is definitely a groundswell of growing awareness that is just ready to flourish even more when the time is ripe. How do we get everyone on board? Because there are so many different perspectives on what that awareness is. And there are some people who identify as atheists, others as agnostics. So how do we elevate the overall consciousness with those varying perspectives? All those perspectives are just part of the collective expression of human consciousness at the level that it's at right now. There's a force at work that is pushing for awakening, that's always been pushing for awakening, and that sometimes does lead to a great explosion and a great awakening. It may not necessarily look spiritual, but there have been periods in the history of the planet where these awakenings happen. They happen in our own lifetime as well. So a bigger awakening is just a much more global realization happening. I don't know that there's going to be one central voice, but I think that it's sort of happening all over the planet and eventually it will come to pass. I believe it will, but you know, I don't like making predictions. I don't like that I got the prediction that it's going to happen in my lifetime because what if it doesn't? <laughs> but that's the information that was given to me. And even though I'm apprehensive about sharing it because I, I'm not someone to make predictions. I think it's important for us to take responsibility for our lives and not sit around and wait for something to happen because it's supposed to happen. I can definitely see that it's happening. You know, before a revolution happens, nobody thinks anything's going on. But then you realize when you look back that all of these forces were at play. And then, you know, the historians then go and they put together the pieces and they're like, oh, that's why the Berlin Wall fell at that exact moment. But you don't see what's happening before the actual moment 
before the chrysalis cracks open and the butterfly emerges. And you just know something's going on, but you're not quite sure what changes are afoot. All kinds of shifts are taking place in human consciousness that are supporting an awakening. You mentioned realization earlier, and so that would be individual realizations. At the same time, we're influencing one another. You are obviously influencing people through your teachings. And there's also this idea of energy. I'm a huge believer in the power of energy. I'm just interested in your thoughts. So if someone is elevating their individual vibration, does that do something to influence the overall vibration? You mean collectively? Yes. It can, yeah. The reason why I ask the question is because when you say that you believe that in this lifetime there will be a collective awakening, there has to be some sort of acceleration. So what accelerates it? It's enough human beings really opening up to the energy of enlightenment, to the influence of the divine. Once enough people open up, and more and more people are opening up, so once it reaches a, enough of a critical mass, that's what can create a, an actual shift. And then that shift just carries everyone along collectively in, until there's a new balance that's reached. And, you know, we've seen this in, in the past hundred years, societally, how many changes have taken place where beforehand you thought like, these changes are never going to take place. You know, women are never going to get the right to vote. Like all of these things that, that have happened are proof of these shifts that are taking place in the past 150 years. I mean, so many changes have taken place in our society to move us towards being more open and loving and inclusive. All of the things that are an expression of our higher natures, it's happening. It's just at the same time that it's happening, there's also all the forces that are resisting it. But once the shift takes place and all the people that resist it, they happily wave the banner and say, yeah, we were with you guys all along. <laughs> I want to get your perspective on what you think resilience is. Resilience is, it's really a fundamental quality of the soul. The soul is resilient because ultimately the soul knows that this is all a divine play. And that, that knowing that although it, it's real and we experience it as real, ultimately it's not really real. It's all a play. And that everything changes and eventually what is happening now isn't going to last forever and this will pass. So the soul knows that and that's what gives the soul its resilience. That's why when we're younger, we're so much more resilient and we can go through so much more. We still haven't lost touch with our true nature. And so we can be bullied at school and be shamed and you know have dysfunctional parents and completely normalize it all and just keep going. <laughs> it's complete insanity because we still haven't lost touch with our true nature, which is resilient built into that there's an inherent i think hope or a trust in life but as we lose it then we lose that resilience as well as whatever else we lose when we lose touch with our true nature joy peace equanimity love what are your practices of resilience for me it's very important to be fit physically i find that you know if the body is unwell and i've had some health struggles particularly in the last three years where i was bedridden and there were nights when I wasn't sure whether I would get through the night and even if I wanted to, because what I was met with on the other side was just pain and uh, incapacity. You know, I've suffered uh, a couple of bouts of paralysis descended into my arms and my legs uh, and, and I've had so much pain. <laughs> just like, like when you're not physically well, that resilience is not as strong. It's still there, but it's definitely not as strong. And it's easy to fall into despair and be like, why even? I mean, if all I can, if all I'm experiencing is pain, what is the point? Luckily, I got through it and I'm able to focus on, on getting strong physically. For resilience, it's being strong physically. Running is my first joy. It's the first thing I discovered after awakening, the importance of, of moving and keeping the body fit and healthy. That gives you that resilience. It's interesting that you mentioned physicality because you spend so much time in the spiritual realm. But I do see a connection. I do see a connection between getting not only physically fit, but also expending energy, physical energy to make room for the spiritual work. So it's interesting hearing that from you. Yeah, it's important. I mean, for some people, it may not be as important. But for me, it's, it's extremely important. If I can't run, if, I, if I'm not able to be physically strong and active, I don't lose all hope and despair, but uh, I admire people that are so physically incapacitated and that they don't lose their joy. I wonder maybe if 
if that happened to me, perhaps I would find the joy, even though I couldn't run anymore. But I don't want I don't want to think about that right now. <laughs> I want to keep running for a little while longer. I'm sorry that happened to you. If it's okay, I want to ask you what happened. Uh, I had a mystery illness, I, I, just an illness that doctors couldn't explain. I don't really have a diagnosis, but I have symptoms. And because, you know, doctors don't know it, doctors can't explain it, nothing shows up on tests. <laughs> it can be quite difficult to get the help that you need because you don't even know what it is that you're dealing with. But I found a way to get well enough to not be as bad off as I was. And at this point, you know, they often say that, you know, once you lose an ability, you don't gain it back. It's something doctors often tell you, like, you know, I've had facial paralysis twice. Like they said, that's it. You're never going to be able to recover any movement. That's not true. I'm continuing to heal. So at this point, I'm just focused on recovery and recovering as much of my lost ability and hopefully keeping the pain at bay. It's much more manageable now than it was before. I'm not in pain all the time, but for a year, I lived with pain. I was quite desperate. I would use pain medication when I couldn't bear it anymore. And then once it got to a tolerable level, I would wean off. Now I'm not taking anything. So that's good. I mean, I still have pain, but it's not nearly as bad as it was. Pain like that, we talked about existential suffering, which is sort of like what people think of when they think about the spiritual path. But the physical pain, it changes you. When you're in that much pain for that long, it changes you. And it has made me far more heart-centered than I ever was before. I was heart-centered, but not much of a deeply feeling person. Now my, my empathy, my compassion for other people's suffering is so much, I'm so much more sensitive now to that. I was sensitive, but I, I think in the past, I could have also been quite dismissive because my body was functioning perfectly and I was existing in a, in a transcendental state of bliss and peace for most of my waking life. So when people talked about their own pain and struggles, I didn't have as much empathy for that. Not that I didn't have any, but now I know what people go through when they suffer physically. And it's, it's opened my heart up. I'm glad to hear that you're in a better place. And it sounds like you were able to learn and you're still learning from that experience. Thank you. How can people reach you if they want to contact you and, and how can they purchase your books? All of that is accessible through my website, stephendomico.com. So if you go there, you can get in touch with me. My books are available on my website. Before we close, I want to read a poem actually from the back of your second book, The Incredible State of Absolute Nothingness. The name of the poem is Nirvana. When God's consciousness reinstalls, it forces the dismantling of our walls and strips the self with a devouring hand, leaving us naked with no place to stand. Upon a groundless ground made of energy, where we merge and meet our true identity. Even the trail of our journey steps disappear in this almighty eclipse. A blissful emptiness replaces our vacancy that dreams of a life filled with felicity, freed from the ego's karmic needs, replaced by love's eternal ease and the burning desire that our souls release. What the divine on earth wants to unleash in waves that make all our activity an endless expression of heaven's harmony descending from these timeless peaks our fount filled angels made to reach our human need to blissfully release into this life an evolving peace thank you stephen it was such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for sharing yourself, bearing yourself and inspiring us on our own personal spiritual journeys, our spiritual paths. Thank you, Fabio. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure and a treat and I appreciate the opportunity. <music> 
Thank you for listening to The Stumbling Spirit, Contemplations on the Path of Resilience. This is Fabio da Silva Fernandez. Join me again next week for another episode of transformative stories and beneficial practices to guide you on your wellness journey. If you wish, you can follow and DM me on Instagram at The Stumbling Spirit. Until next time, take a deep breath and another step forward on your path of resilience. Thank you.